Thanks for reminding me. Welcome everybody to the very first uh, AMS colloquium of the fall 2016 semester. So glad you could make it. Uh, as you now see, you'll have to start getting here early because we're going to pack the place and uh, have exciting things happening. You'll notice a little bit different format from what you've normally <laughs> seen at Colloquia before. Um, so we're going to do a couple different things. So uh, sit tight and, uh, and enjoy the show. Um, I'm your host, Paul Constantine. I'm the prof assistant professor and in the Applied Math and Stats Department. Um, so the way we're going to start uh, this one is um, we have some new people serving as uh, AMS Colloquium Correspondents. So the Colloquium Correspondents will give some uh, interesting stories that are going on in mathematics, both outside the department and inside the department. And to start things out, um, we've got Izzy Aguiar to <coughs> give a presentation on earthquakes and crime. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. <laughs> so ever since the earthquake in Italy happened last week, and of course every single time any earthquake ever happens, this comes up, and it's why can't statisticians predict earthquakes? Like, why can't you? Um, and it's because they are independent events, and the one predictor we have of the destructive S waves are the P waves, which just show up seconds before. So if we are going to predict these destructive earthquakes, it's like, oh, well, all right, it's happening now. <laughs> so um, because they aren't independent, um, yeah, it's hard to predict them. But oh, this is the Italy earthquake that just happened. <coughs> but so what statisticians have started concentrating on is the probability that an earthquake is likely to occur in a specific region over a given amount of time. And so the, there's this huge conspiracy theory about the Portland earthquake and that um, actually, what it is, is that in the next 50 years, there's a one in three probability that this massive earthquake is going to occur. And so how we benefit from that is making sure that the infrastructure is safe enough to withstand an earthquake, or that when this earthquake happens, we can minimize the damage that happens. So what can we do with all of this earthquake <coughs> statistics? So although we can't predict earthquakes, we can predict the subsequent aftershocks that happen, and that's using um, Hawks process. Oops. Um, and so, what Hawks process does is that after there's a there's an initial earthquake, we can say, okay, well, there's going to be an aftershock here and here and here. And what people have started doing is applying the Hawks process to other aspects of our everyday life. And so, one thing that they've started doing is using Hawks process to model terrorist attacks. Um, and so some PhD people in England started doing it to um, retros, retroactively model the troubles. Um, and they were a terrorist group in Northern Ireland in 1969 through 98. And using Hawks process, they were able to accurately model when these, in certain phases of the terrorist attacks, they were able to model when certain attacks would occur, certain bombings would occur. Um, and so they're hoping that we can use this in our current climate of total fear of terrorism um, and hoping that math can somehow help us out. Um, another way that we are using Hawks process is um, crime is also modeled in the same way. So if there's a burglary at my house tonight, then they're able to say that over the next couple of days, it's pretty likely that more crimes are going to happen in that area, and they can model when and where in a given region. And so some app developers have created an app in the States um, that they give to police officers. And the police officers get their app, and they look at it, and there's a little red square, and it says, OK, like this is where the crime is most likely to happen tonight. and regions that are implementing the software in this app, crime has gone down by 30%. So it's wow. kind of this like futuristic, like predictive crime um, <laughs> solving. But I think it is important for us, while we concentrate on all of our statistics and math, to also be able to step outside of that and think about the possible consequences of getting predictive area and saying this is where crime's likely to happen. But anyway, I think it's very interesting that even though statistics isn't very helpful for modeling earthquakes, earthquakes <coughs> can give us data that can help us predict other things. Um, yeah. 
Thank you, Izzy. Uh, she was our very first ever AMA Philippine <laughs> correspondent. So let's give her a hand just one more time. Ever AMS colloquium correspondent, we have Jessica Daters, uh, and Jessica will describe her local math news story. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Jessica, I'm a senior in math. Um, so for this story, I decided, um, Izzy and I decided together actually, um, that we have three new professors in our math department, and so we wanted to choose one of them to kind of introduce to you all. Um, to kind of give you an overview of how they ended up at MINES, the research that they've done to get here, um, and then the research that they're interested in doing and continuing um, at MINES. So the first professor that we chose is Dr. Ashley Munson. Um, so Dr. Munson actually attended MINES for her master's and PhD, and she worked with Dr. Navidi. Um, they did biostatistics research. And then after Dr. Munson finished her PhD, she moved up to Pacific Lutheran University, um, where she worked for seven years. Um, but at Pacific Lutheran, there were not necessarily statisticians there or biostatisticians to be able to continue that vein of research. So she started working with assessment, um, becoming um, part of a research team or being hired on as a consultant. Um, but eventually she made her way into a group at Rice that is looking at introductory chemistry courses um, and looking at more effective ways of teaching those courses. So they've been collecting data for the last six or seven years um, and trying to basically figure out how far into active learning we should go. Um, so Dr. Munson made the great point that some lecturers just have it down um, and in those instances, those lectures are very effective um, and don't necessarily need to incorporate those active learning components, but there are other courses, um, especially at the lower division, where the active learning component can be very helpful, um, especially in making the classroom experience something that's worth paying for um, as we are kind of entering this era where we can just get this online degree. Um, so it helps to differentiate the classroom experience from that online experience. Um, so this uh, group that she is a part of with Rice, um, they tried to implement the scale up um, model into the chemistry setting. So if you're not familiar with what scale up means, it's essentially the sort of active learning program we've implemented in the physics studios at Mines. So um, they have some sort of discussion or lecture and then they go into a studio type environment where they're working in groups to solve problems. Um, and there are professors and TAs present to help them if they get stuck. Um, but Dr. Munson made the awesome point that that is really only effective if you have enough instructors and TAs to help the students when they get stuck. Otherwise, the students just get frustrated and they hit roadblocks and they're left with concepts that they don't really understand. Um, and she also made the great point that this is a lot more effective with lower division classes than with upper division classes. Um, and that uh, oh my gosh. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> there is a difference between computational and theoretical courses. So courses that are very heavy in the computation, like the Phys 1 course, um, can work really well with this scale-up model that they've developed. But courses that focus more on theoretical, so if you think of like an intro to analysis course, um, even some chemistry courses that are really heavy in um, the theoretical concepts, that's not quite as effective with this scale-up model um, because you can't just necessarily set the students loose um, because if you set them loose on a proof, they're likely to hit a roadblock um, pretty quickly and it just requires a different sort of approach. So in summary, the research that she has been doing is to determine the effectiveness of active learning um, what environments they work best in, how we can adapt them to different disciplines within STEM, um, and that is something that she hopes to be able to continue at MINES, um, specifically uh, with the statistics courses that she's going to get to teach. So um, that is what I have on Dr. Munson. Um, very exciting stuff, especially with where our with where MINES is headed um, with active learning, the Trophy Institute, and all of that. So thank you. Great.
once again, that was colloquium correspondent Jessica Daters. Once again, she was the second to ever have done this, so give her a hand one more time. The rest of you students, if you would like to be a colloquium correspondent and give a presentation on some interesting math thing happening out in the world or happening in the department, please contact me and let me know. All right, and now I get to introduce our featured speaker for the first colloquium of, of the semester, uh, Dr. Stephen Becker from, from uh, Colorado Boulder. Dr. Becker, Good nice to meet you. Yeah. Yep. So normally what happens in, uh, in a colloquium is I would say something like, this is where Dr. Becker went to school, and this is what he works on, and this is his position, and then he goes and gives a talk. Instead of that, I'm going to interview Dr. Becker now. So we can hear in his own words what his uh, interests and career path have been. And for this interview, um, I've chosen a nice scenic place to set the interview. We're going to be in Santorini, Greece um, <laughs> for this interview. <laughs> Dr. Becker, welcome to Colorado School of Mines. Thanks. Good to be in Colorado. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for visiting us at the AMS Colloquium. Um, you're an assistant professor in applied mathematics at Boulder. You've been there for two years. So what was the path that took you to uh, this position? Uh, well, I went to school, so I went to a liberal arts college, um, I did math and physics, uh, I decided to switch to computational physics, um, naturally, I actually switched because of a girl, oh. <laughs> <laughs> unnaturally, I switched so that I wouldn't have to be on campus over the summer, um, found applied math, went to applied math grad school, went to France for postdoc because I could, um, did postdocs, liked it, Applied to places and eventually came here. All right. Um, so, how would you describe your particular topic, and then why have you chosen to work on that? Sure. So, in applied math, we'd say that I'm a computational mathematician. Mm -hmm. um, I would say I do optimization. Optimization. Um, and optimization, I think, so. I'd say I do optimization and apply to statistical problems, and I think that's where the questions are. Um, we're in an era of big data, and big data is computation, but statistics and combining the two is, is where the difficulties are. So what is one of those difficulties specifically? Maybe something that might foreshadow what you're going to talk about. Right, so suppose you have a large data set, how can you compute with it? Um, so my talk will be one way to do that. In general, now does I say we have big data? You have to talk not just about the methods, but what time can afford. So you have like a computational time budget, what can you afford? So you don't think about just methods, you think about computation time and methods together. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, so how about this? I, I noticed that during uh, during your education, you worked with Emmanuel Candes, right? He's, he's a big name in this field. Uh, so what was it like working with Professor Candes? Sure. So I'll tell you, you can also you can ask Mike Wakeman too, yeah. one of his postdoctoral students. Uh, I guess what stuck out was he respected students a lot, I mm. thought. So I, I came guess in there. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ho hopefully, so I have some students here from CU in the audience. Hopefully, I respect them. Um, <laughs> but it was nice coming in as a graduate student and having, having a professor respect you as a, as a potential colleague. So that was very nice. Um, yeah, and I guess he just, not so much technical, but just, you know, focusing on problems for the right reason, I mm -hmm. guess. That's something he emphasized. Impact. Yeah. Something like that. Okay. Good. Uh, so I also noticed that you write your own software, or a lot of your own software, and you also make it publicly available on GitHub. Um, do you have strong feelings about open source software? Yeah, in particular, as an academic. I mean, so here, like, we're supported by Colorado Taxpayer Money. Mm -hmm. So, in that sense, yeah, I think our that's job is to too, So thank you for supporting yeah. us. Yeah. Uh, so right, that's why we have coffee today, right? Right. Yes. <laughs> um, so I feel like as an academic, I have responsibility. Um, so for open source, yeah, there's a question between like copy left and copy right. And I worked at IBM Research for a while. Mm -hmm. I should mention one of my postdocs at IBM Research, and there. They're a little more worried with copyleft licenses, and, and it sort of what became what a little is more a copyleft license. So, so that you can't, if I understand that, it's something like the GPL. So where you have an open source, but to use it, you have to to use it and release, you have to use the same license. So you can't make it closed source later. Um, sorry, that's not copyleft. That's GPL. Okay. 
So to some places like Ivy Research would prefer a copy left where they have no restriction at all. Um, I think a little more sympathetic with the copy left, just because these people at these research places, they can't use these because of some commercial, basically the bosses, they can't use code as GPL, for example, because it might end up in a product and they can't make it open source. Um, and a lot of these are academic projects, so being a little more sympathetic to that cause. It's not just GPL. Uh -huh. But overall, I think, bottom line, as academics, we have a responsibility to make it free. So the, the flip side of that is that um, it's hard to measure the impact of software for someone who is an academic. So how do you try to encourage people to sort of recognize the impact of your, of your open source software as part of your career progression? Sure. So, so one way is so. It's not a publication. It's yeah. Not, right. Yeah. Uh, one is if it is actually popular, then people will recognize it on its own. Mm -hmm. So you can try to make it popular. One of the best things you can do is support the code, mm -hmm. um, fix bugs, and so on like that. Um, fix your bugs. Yeah. In terms of making it count, uh, that's a harder question. Um, or maintaining it for many years, it's kind of thankless work. If you get a student to do it, they don't get a publication on it. If you do it, you don't get a publication. So I don't think I've solved that problem yet. Yeah. So. Open problems from Dr. Yeah. Stephen Becker. Uh, so last question. What do you do besides math and, uh, and career things? Uh, well, so I have two young kids, and I take care of kids. You're right. <laughs> uh, I used to do things. Uh, <laughs> I used to climb mountains. OK. And the best was being in grad school. I asked my advisor if I got three weeks off to go climb in Alaska, and he said yes. So I'm eternally greatly, you know, eternally grateful for him saying yes. So that's the great thing about grad student. You can now any other jobs. You can just say, "Can I take three weeks off, please?" Yeah. Cool. All but right. My students don't get three weeks off. I'll say the reason. All right. Let's thank Dr. Becker for telling us about himself, and now we get to move to his talk. Oh, I'm oh, um, sorry, I forgot this. We also have a gift for you. Yeah, it's a surprise. Oh, right. So we have this fancy notebook with uh, the department logo and name on it, and then also a mug and a pen. So you get to take something home. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Oh, and you'll need this. Oh, and I'm supposed to mic up, right? Uh, no, it's fine. No. Right okay. All right, so thanks very much for having me here. Um, I'm going to talk about some work with one of my students. So I have a lot of students in the audience. Um, Leo, James, Derek, Jessica, anyone else? <coughs> and the student I'm doing the work with is not here. Uh, the only student is not here, Farhad. He actually came last fall to be an instructor here in electrical engineering. So he is responsible for a lot of the proofs um, and some, some stuff motivating this beforehand. Um, so it's really his work too. So I'm going to talk about sampling large data sets. Um, let me explain to you what we're going to do. So we're going to talk about reducing dimension. You have a large data set. We want to reduce dimension to make it simpler to work with. So I'll go over some background there. I'm going to talk about clustering, which is sort of the most basic machine learning task you could ask for. So I'll go over that in a little bit of detail. Then I'll talk about what we're going to do. So we have an approach in general, sort of a general procedure. We're going to apply it for this talk to k-means clustering. So I'll show you how it applies to clustering. Um, we analyze it. And that will sort of motivate why I did exactly what I did. And then I'll show you some experiments that we did on the computers. So I'm starting with a large data set here. It's p by n. You might think of data sets where each row is a new entry. For me, each column is a new entry. Right? So maybe you have a lot of images, images on the internet, for example. n would be the number of images. Uh, each image is 5 megapixels. So P will represent the dimension, the size of each image. If it's a, an image, flatten it out into a vector, for example. So we have a large data set here. And I'm interested in making it smaller. So reducing dimension here. And why would I want to do this? Well, there's a lot of obvious reasons. You can say, well, the smaller it is, the faster it is to work with. In particular, there's many techniques, something like an SVD or something, where if you take SVD of this matrix, it's order P squared times N as long as n is bigger than p. So I can make p smaller by making this smaller. If it's, say, a factor of 2 smaller, I get a factor of 4 speed up. That's one reason to make it faster. So that would be my main motivation for what we'll talk about today. You can use it for other things. For example, 
PCA is a, a class of that need to reduce dimension. In PCA, one of the reasons you might do it is to denoise. You say, well, these components are irrelevant to my signal, so that I remove them, I'm just removing noise, therefore I've denoised a little bit. <clears throat> you can say, well, another reason would be if you were degrees of freedom, you might put this into another algorithm that does regression, something like this. You don't want to overfit on a data set, so the fewer parameters there are, the less likely you're to overfit. And finally, you can say, well, if I can make this two or three dimensions, then actually plot the data points. So I have a nice representation. So our main goal will be the first one here. And dimension reduction is sort of a big topic. I've simplified it here to the case of matrices. And in particular, I'm looking at this setting where P is less than N, non-asymptotic results, sort of a modern flavor. So P and N are fixed. They're not going to infinity. And it's a non-invasion setup. So I don't have a prior on X. So I'm going to talk about some, some existing methods to do this. And I'm going to talk about a class of methods to start with. So this class of methods is sort of the simplest method you can think of. I want to make a small matrix from a big matrix. I'm going to multiply by this matrix. Okay. So it just changes dimension. And I'll talk about different choices for this matrix phi. So here's one I'm starting with because a lot of you will know this one. It's PCA, Principal Component Analysis. So I have a data set. X is my data set. I'm going to do the SVD on this. And I'm decomposing in such a way that almost all the energy is concentrated on these, these first few singular values in that top block. And then this one here is very, very small. I do PCA by taking V to be U1 transpose. So when I multiply this out, I completely kill off this because the singular vectors are orthogonal to each other. So I'm killing off everything there. I'm just keeping a smaller portion of the matrix. And it's containing most of the matrix. Uh, you know, so this is classical based on the SVD in the sense that you have good approximation of spectral Frobenius norm. Okay, so this is not going to apply to me because I'm thinking about big data sets where P and N are really, really large. If I want to do this, how much computation cost does it take? Well, what are P squared times N if I do a direct method? Or about P small times P times N. The number, basically the number of singular values I want to be P small if I do some kind of Krylov method like conjugate gradient. Um, sorry, or a long show, something like that. Okay, so it's, it's going to be too costly for me to talk about today. It's also nonlinear. So it looks linear because I'm taking a matrix multiplying by x that looks very linear, but this matrix actually depends on x in the first place, right? Because it's based on the single vector of x. So it's a nonlinear method. Um, in particular, because of that nonlinear fashion, I can't just apply it once to my data set. I have to figure out what this matrix is first and then apply it. So it can take several steps. So we'll talk about that in more detail in a minute. OK, so a second method here is subsampling rows. So well, here's a large data set. What's a nice way to, to make it small? I'll just pick a few of these rows, right? So you have a bunch of different features. I'll just pick some of them. The question is, how do you pick them? Well, you can pick them uniformly at random. This is generally a bad idea. You, you, there's no reason to think, well, you know, maybe this component actually is more important than everything else. And if you didn't pick it, you lost everything. So you can say, well, maybe I'll, I'll do a weighted kind of sampling. So I'll say, I'm going to pick the rows according to the norm of the row. That does a little better. It doesn't do that well. And in particular, it also is more expensive to compute because I have to go through the matrix, figure that out, and then go through it once more. So you also say it's nonlinear. And a nicer way would say, we can sample according to leverage scores. Leverage scores means you take the SVD of this, you look at the left singular vectors, look at the norm of those singular vectors when they're truncated, and that gives you the weighted distribution. That's a better way to go, but you have to do an SVD first. A partial approximate SVD, yes, but it's still kind of expensive. So we'll actually compare with the method that does this. This is sort of a, a recent idea. OK, let's talk about something what by now we could call it classical. It's from the 1980s. It's the johnson lindner strauss approach. It says, well, one way to reduce dimension is to multiply by a random matrix. So I call this matrix E rand n for the MATLAB Gaussian generation. And it says, I'm just going to pick a random matrix and multiply it. It's basically going to mix everything. So I haven't missed anything, but I am mixing these together. Um, you, you will lose a few things. Um, but we can prove, well, if I want to have a certain amount of error. So here I'm saying there's a pairwise distance between all these. I'm not changing pairwise distance, except for this little factor of epsilon, as long as I take this many rows. And the amazing thing is that the number of rows I need 
depends on the accuracy, depends a little bit on how many points they have, and it's completely independent of the dimension. So this is a, a very nice result. If you think about PCA, it's sort of, let's compare it to PCA a little bit. It's a bit different than PCA, it's probabilistic, of course, that's one thing. But it's linear, that's a really big advantage. So I'm doing something linear, D does not depend on my data set. So that's pretty amazing. It's not orthogonal. Um, but there's also a cost to it. It's a dense matrix multiplier, so it's a little bit expensive. So we're not going to compare with this method either. But now I'm going to talk about a variant of that method. So instead of multiplying by a random matrix, well, so a Gaussian random matrix, I'm going to make a very special structure random matrix. I'm going to call it a random orthogonal system. I'm going to compose myself of a diagonal matrix with plus minus ones on the, on the diagonal, a Fourier matrix, and now I'm going to pick out the rows. I'm going to select a few rows at random. The idea is that these are going to mix my matrix, and then I can pick rows. So it's not rows of the original matrix, it's rows of the mixed matrix. And if you combine this all and look at this matrix E, it looks a little bit like a Gaussian, and you can show similar results to johnson lemmis strauss So this is known as the fast johnson lemmis strauss that was first analyzed well in this paper from the mid-2000s. And why do we call it fast? Because we can apply it faster than dense matrix multiply. Right, so applying a diagonal matrix is linear. Applying the FFT is my notation here, uh, P log P, and then I just pick out a few rows. So instead of multiplying by a dense P by P matrix, it's a structured matrix, right? So I use FFT. So this is a fast approach. Um, so before I go on with my stuff, I thought since this is a colloquium, if you haven't seen these things, let me give you some examples other than my talk where you might want to use these things. So one example is these squares. So coming from applied math, I like these squares problems. They're nice and simple. We know how to solve it. So the, the first level, we say, oh, you just solve the normal equations. And then you look into it, and there's a lot of interesting details. So suppose we want to solve this. And the wrinkle here is going to be that it's very, very large and perhaps ill-conditioned. So how do I solve this? Well, one idea is you could do an iterative method, something like conjugate gradients. Instead of doing conjugate gradients on normal equations, you normally use something like uh, LSQR. So think of conjugate gradients. You do some an iterative product method, and it's going to depend on the separation of your eigenvalues. Now, you can kind of simplify that by saying it depends on the condition number. Well, one of the main topics of research for the conjugate gradients is how to find a good preconditioner. So I have a very good preconditioner. I'm trying to solve this problem. Well, let's take the QR decomposition of A. So Q is a tall, skinny orthogonal matrix. R is triangular, so I can invert it quickly with back substitution. Well, a good preconditioner is R. I can change variables x to r times x. Then I can put this r inverse in the problem. And now I have my matrix a times r inverse. a times r inverse is just q. And q is a partial orthogonal matrix. It's perfectly conditioned. So I could converge in one step. You don't do this because finding qr on a big matrix is the hardest solving this problem. So instead, what you could say is, well, instead of doing this, let's do the qr on the sketched version of the matrix the reduced dimension version of the matrix. That should be approximately capturing the ideas, the, the information in A. I do this, and I should get a pretty good preconditioner. So this has been implemented. If you're familiar with these methods with conjugate gradient, you would know Page and Saunders. And Saunders actually wrote a paper at LSRN a few years ago talking about this randomized approach to these classical methods. Another way you can do this, you can also prove if I just sketch the problem, I just reduce the dimension of everything, including the right-hand side, and solve this related problem, and just look at the minimizer of this, with a dense method, for example, you can show that your answer is not too far off. The nice thing here is that, again, the number of rows you need is independent of the dimension P. So if you have a really large <laughs> matrix, a lot of rows, you don't need a, that doesn't come into your answer, only the number of columns. Okay. So, let me talk about clustering a little bit. We're going to talk about k-means clustering. The idea behind clustering, we have an unsupervised machine learning method. You have some data, you want to infer some clusters from it. So, you think of images, if you want to say, is this image a dog or a cat? That's more like a supervised problem. I know there's different categories, and I want to say, is it in this category or this category? This is more like, here's some images. How many clusters, how many types of categories are there in the first place? So here I've, I've stylized into two dimensions. I have um, eight points, these little black things here. And I'm going to start 
by saying my definition of a cluster is going to be I'm going to have a cluster center, and the points nearest to it belong to that cluster. So I have to start, where do I start my cluster centers? Well, these triangles here, or these stars represent the cluster centers. I'm going to start them at some points. I'm going to initialize here. And now I'm going to assign points to a cluster. So to assign points to a cluster, I can say which cluster center is nearest. These points are nearest to the red star. These are nearest to the blue star. So then I make the assignments. Once I have assignments, I update the cluster center by saying, of the entries assigned to, of the data points assigned to that, let's be the average of those. So I'm going to move a little bit over here. I'm going to move over here. And now I have new centers. I can repeat the process. So I say, I have new centers that moved a little bit. Now I'm going to recompute the assignments. This doesn't change. This does change. This point now belongs over here instead of the blue one. And you just iterate this process. OK, so let's put some notation on here. So what do I do? I have some points, xi. I have centers, k centers. k is going to be the number of clusters I have. That's the one parameter you choose. And what do I do? Well, I update the cluster centers according to who belongs there. I find their average. Once I do that, I then update the assignments. And the assignments, each, each point i is assigned to one of k clusters. Here's just an example with more points of what it looks like. A bunch of different points, and you pick out some clusters. So what's the computation involved in? Well, let's say, look at finding the assignments. I have some xi. Which cluster do I assign it to? Well, I need to find the distance to all the different cluster centers. So for each i, I have to do k computation of this distance. This distance, we use are p-dimensional vectors. So that's cost of p to find this distance. So I have to do overall for all the data points, k times n times p. It's reasonably expensive for a large data set. And we say, well, if we can reduce the dimension, then we just change this p to a p small. That's the main idea. Not that revolutionary yet. And we're going to introduce a variant to what I showed you, where we don't actually keep a small dimension. We're going to keep the same dimension, but just only keep p small entries. So we're going to make it sparse. So let's talk about that. Now, before we get there, one of the reasons for what we did is this idea of a low pass algorithm. So let me define what I mean by low pass. And let me start with memory in a computer. So in your computer, you have something like RAM, where almost all the computations are done. And then you move to the CPU. There's more memory on the CPU. And then your data, your files are stored on the hard drive. So if I have a large data set, suppose it's five terabytes, I can't fit it all into RAM at once. So what do I have to do? I have to load some into RAM, then get rid of it, load some more into RAM, get rid of it, and so on like that. So if you have a very large data set that you can't fit into your RAM, you, will, you have to load it very often. right? And loading from your hard drive is quite slow. If your computer is not a solid state computer, you probably notice starting from a new program takes a while. Solid state drive computers are much faster at this kind of stuff. They're no faster at the computation once you're in RAM, but they're faster loading things. So loading data is slow. That's a bottleneck. You can also have an architecture like this where you have lots of computers, say a server farm of computers, you have a huge data set, you know, millions of terabytes. You want to look at something where well, you have to load it. It also means you have to send it over some wires somewhere, over some Ethernet, or some fiber. And so that's also very slow. So loading data is one of our bottlenecks. It's, it's a sort of recent paradigm saying communication is perhaps your dominant bottleneck rather than the flops and the actual computation. So when I say low pass, Passes means how many times I have to load the data set from memory. Maybe the simplest is an example. So here's an example of a two-pass algorithm. I have my data set x. Suppose I want to find how far this data set x is from the global mean mu. What's well, this two-step procedure? First, I have to find this global mean mu. So I don't know what it is. I'll set it to 0. I'm going to loop here. So I'm going to divide my indices, 1 to n, into these partitions, i sub k. Loop over these partitions. I'm partitioning the data because I can't fit it all into memory at once. So I say, well, some subset of it can fit into memory. I'll load that into memory. I'll add it to my mean here. I'll get rid of it and load a new one. Now I'm going to normalize at the end. So I found my mean. And now I'm going to find the distance to the mean. So I'm going to load all the data again and then find the distance to the mean. So the two-step procedure. Right, so this would be a two-pass algorithm. So 
if you're a one-pass algorithm, it's special. We call it streaming. And it means, for example, you don't never need to store the entire data set. So an example would be Google, right? Google wants to index the web. They have to look at every website, so they download the website. Can they store the entire web on the servers all at once? No, that's, that's infeasible, right? But they download the whole web. They just never store it. So they download a website, they look at it, they find the links, they find the relevant information, they do some analysis, whatever they want to do, store the information, and then they discard it, download a new website. So we call this a streaming algorithm, a one pass. Okay, so with big data, it's nice to have streaming algorithms. So that's going to motivate what we talk about. Okay, so our main idea is well, let's just sample the matrix. Instead of reducing dimension, we'll just sample the entries. That's kind of a reasonable idea. Uh, you couldn't really say it without it at first because it's a pretty obvious idea. But in 2001, some people analyzed it very nicely. Okay, so it's been sort of yeah, it's been thought about quite a bit since then. They analyzed just sampling randomly. We're going to do something a little different. Instead of sampling randomly, we're going to say, well, same thing we did before. When you sample the rows, <coughs> uniform sampling of the rows is not a good idea. But if you put it into this random orthogonal system, it actually works quite well. We're going to do something similar. We're going to multiply by f and d. Notice that these are orthogonal. So in particular, multiplying by these is not going to change norms in the spectral norm or for Venus norm or L2 norm for vectors. So we're going to multiply by this and precondition the matrix. So we call this preconditioning. And now we're going to sample the entries. So hopefully that's clear. It's a pretty straightforward idea, I think. So why would we want to do this? Well, what's wrong with just uniform sampling the data? It doesn't work very well. So you say, well, let's do weighted sampling of the data. Right? So for example, the paper here proposed that a few years ago. Let's just weight according to the size of the entry. The problem is you have to normalize by something when you do this weighted sampling. You have to make a full pass to the data set, and then you can figure out what your weighted scheme is. So it's a two-pass algorithm. Okay, so that's, that's a disadvantage of that. We're going to look at it a different way. We'll see in a minute in the analysis the theorems we have. Result, they depend on these quantities, like this is basically the L-infinity norm. I call it the max entry norm. Just the max amount of value of your matrix. It's going to depend on this. Now, of course, there's a normalization, right? There's always a scalar uh, normalization. Let's just say each column is normalized in L2 norm by 1. Well, how big could this be? Well, a vector that has norm 1 could have all the energy on one component and zeros everywhere else. So when I sample it, if I miss that one component, it's disaster. Much better is if it's spread out among all the vectors. Okay. And that's sort of what this is capturing. So the best case is if it's completely spread out, each entry has size 1 over square root of p. So the maximum is also 1 over square root of p. That's sort of the best case for the sampling. It means that if I wanted to do this sampling like this, it wouldn't matter because everything has the same magnitude. So I'm not going to make it exactly the same magnitude. Rather, I can prove that if I condition this way, and my preconditioner is unitary, so I don't change this condition, then the maximum entry is with very high probability not much larger than 1 over square root of p, which is the best possible. So that's the motivation for the precondition. OK, so I'm going to apply it to k-means in a minute. And there's two related approaches from the past few years by, so these are standard randomized uh, sketching people. They have some good ideas. And these, this is sort of one of the big ideas is this leverage score, a nice way to sample the rows. So we'll compare against this. We're going to sample rows according to weighted distribution. We're going to figure out the weights with this randomized SVD and so on like this. And another way, even simpler, is say, well, we're just going to do it the johnson linus strauss way. We're going to pick a matrix, phi, completely random, multiply by our data set and get a smaller matrix, and now just cluster on the smaller matrix. Okay. So these are the sort of related approaches for k-means. What's one good thing about our approach is that it's one pass. Our preconditioning is one pass. So we can find the means of the clusters, the center of the clusters for k-means in one pass. We can find the assignments in one pass. These other methods, feature extraction, for example, which is this one right here, we can find the assignments in one pass. But to find the means, it really takes two passes. You can try it in one pass, and I'll show you what happens in a minute. So if you really can only afford a streaming algorithm, there's not much else you can do other than this approach. Okay. 
So why do we precondition? Let's, well, let's look at this in theory. What can we show about this? So we have several theorems. Our simplest theorem to understand is just suppose I actually know the assignments and I want to estimate the means. Well, I don't I have access to all the data that would contribute to the mean. So here I'm showing you sort of assume this is all belongs to one cluster. So I don't have access to XI. I have access to a sampled version of it. So I don't see each entry XI. I see some of his entries. Then whether I precondition or not, I get this result. I can say my error in the mean is less than t with this kind of probability. 1 minus 2 times p times this quantity here. So it's this nice concentration on equality, meaning that as t gets large, this goes to 0 very, very fast. It depends on some parameters. It depends on this max row and max entry, which is just what I was trying to say. The worst case, that could be large. You know, so you have to normalize somehow. We'll say we're normalized by the columns of norm 1 again. That could be large. If it's not large, then we get a nicer result. Well, and we combine it. We say, if we precondition, so think of this x really as a y, if we precondition, then we can show the probability of the maximum entry or the maximum row. This is the maximum row in the L2 norm. The chance of it being larger than something times 1 over square root of p is quite small. So here I plug in some actual numbers. So you can see that this thing is very, very mild. Right, I'm almost 1 over square root of p. If I plug in something like this, suppose n times p is 10 to the 10, so I have a lot of data. What is this quantity right here? It's 32. Right, so not very large. Square root of the log. <coughs> So we concentrate very, very nicely after applying this. And the larger the data is, the better the concentration. OK, so I just want to give a brief intro to, to what we're doing, um, especially if you're not already a statistician. So it's simplified the setting a lot. Suppose I just say, suppose I have Bernoulli variables, they're plus or minus 1 with equal probability. And I want to look at their normalized sum. Okay. Well, what's the expected value of this? Well, it should be 0 and other variants. So if I expect it to be 0, the questions I'm asking is, how far away is it from 0 on any particular sample? What's the chance that it's really, really far from 0? So the thing I learned in school, the first thing I learned is something like Chebyshev's inequality, which follows from Markov, right? It says something like this. It says the probability that I'm a long ways away from 0 decays like 1 over n and 1 over t squared. Right, so this is not that great. So for example, suppose I put in t equals 0.1. Remember, x is, has a, a fixed scale here, right? These are plus or minus 1 variables. Then the probability that I'm much larger than 0.1 is 1 over 100. Let's do the same thing with the concentration inequality. So it's something like a Bernstein or a Huffington or a Chern, a Chern. So now I plug into this exponential bound. What do I get? Well, if I plug in points, like the same points here, for values of n and t, the chance that I'm much larger than 0.1 is less than 10 to the minus 21. So suddenly we have something that's starting to look pretty, pretty, very sharp. In fact, for our particular bound, it is quite sharp. We can do this experiment. So we pick some data. We want to see how far off are we from the expected value. So we know what we expect the average error to be. And then we have a bound. And we can say, well, let's plug in the bound for something like this should be a t. t is 1 in 1,000. What's the chance that 1 in 1,000 would go above this? Well, we get this line right here. And we actually do our simulation for 1,000 runs, pick the worst one, and we get this line right here. So it's pretty close to the bound you would expect. So we prove bounds like this. The, the Just quickly, what's the error? Error in what? Error, 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 error in the mean? Uh, mean yeah, right. sorry, it would just be like this value here. For example, it would just be this. Okay. Right there. Yeah. Uh, our, our most advanced bound would be one where we do the same thing, not for a center estimate, but for actual taking the matrix and multiplying by itself. And like this, you do this for PCA. So I'm not talking about application to PCA now, but you could use this method for PCA. If you do PCA, then you have to analyze a slightly nastier quantity. We have to use a matrix for scene. We have this recent result from 2014. We can apply this to our case. And our bounds look very similar. They have the same kind of exponential decay. 
Okay, so let's do a little computation. So we're going to apply to the MNIST data set. This is a standard test data set. So we, we have a bunch of examples of handwritten digits, 0 through 9. We're going to look just at 0, 3, and 9 for simplicity. Um, each one, about 7,000 examples of each. They're labeled, so there's a ground truth. Someone went through and, and said, this is, this is really a 3. So it looks something like this. Each one is a 28 by 28 pixel. We're going to flat image. We're going to flatten them out and get p equals 784. So these are the columns of my matrix. And if I do classical techniques on this data set, you can say, well, I know the labels. So let's say every image that belongs to the zero class, let's look at the mean of that. And I get this. Every image that's really a three, take the mean of all those images, I get this, and so on. So this is using sort of this oracle information, the ground truth. Now if I do k-means clustering, I get this. It's completely unsupervised. The only thing it doesn't tell me is the name of this category. So I don't know that it's zero. I just know that this is one category, this is another one, this is another one. OK, so key means works pretty well on this. You can get, well, actually, in fact, if you take this and then look for the accuracy assigning any particular image to which cluster belongs, you get about 92% accuracy with key means. You can do better with fancier machine learning techniques, especially on this data set, because it's been over-optimized because it's an old data set. Okay, so this is sort of our, our benchmark. Let's see if we can do it faster. So let's do our method here. Well, there's sample entries at random. And then do k-means on that sparse matrix. What do we get? Well, our cluster centers look like this. It's actually pretty good. It's not perfect, though, right? You can see this does not look as nice as that zero. This three is not as good as that three. It works maybe unreasonably well because this is a very special test set, right? These are almost binary images, zeros and ones. So there's relative uniform intensity. It's not a big variance in scale. So it works actually surprisingly well. But if we precondition, obviously, see after preconditioning, the difference between what we have and sort of the, the standard reference, you can't really see a difference by that. We do very, very well. Now let's look at these other methods I'll show you. I'll try to do one pass. What do they get? Their assignment accuracy is actually pretty good. But estimating the cluster centers is really bad. We just don't have anything. Right? The, the way I recover these is I basically multiply by the pseudo inverse. And I get junk. So you can fix this with an extra pass through the data. That's why I say to estimate the centers, you really have to do two passes. You can do an extra pass to clean things up, which I won't really talk about. Okay, so why? Why do we work? Our accuracies are comparable in terms of predicting which class you're in, but the centers, we do much better than other methods. What's the difference? Well, one way to think about it is suppose we have a lot of images that are all the same. In the most extreme case, suppose all the images are the same. Well, when you sample entries, you're sampling different entries from each new image. So each new image, you get new information that comes in. If you do the matrix multiplication method, you're not getting new information. Your resulting matrix is just also a constant matrix. You have no new information. Uh, so in particular, as n becomes large, our method gets the right answer. So we say we're consistent. And so for these, we have lots of samples. We have to converge the true answers here. They don't. Uh, we can actually look at the assignment accuracy. So here I'm comparing, here's my benchmark level, but 90% accuracy for key means on the full data set. I'll compare it to the sparsified version with and without preconditioning. So this is with preconditioning and this is without. Here I'm changing how much I compress the data set by. So if this was one, it means I'm keeping all the entries. If it's a 0.05, it means I'm keeping one out of every 20 entries. So you can see, yeah, accuracy gets better as I keep more and more entries. And there's a big difference between preconditioning and not preconditioning. I can compare with these other methods proposed a few years ago, feature selection and feature extraction. In terms of accuracy, you can say they're comparable. We actually do quite a bit better. Another nice benefit is that our variance is much lower. This preconditioning really reduces the variance. So there's actually error bars on here to show you the standard deviation. You can't see them because they're smaller than the marker size here. If you look at this, it has quite a big variance in how well it does. So. 
But I like to motivate what we did, like talk about one pass stuff. One pass only makes sense when you have a big data set. So let's actually look at a big data set. So I'm going to use this infinite MNIST data set, where they take the MNIST and they apply an algorithm procedure to make it as large as you like. Basically extend the examples as long as you want. So we extend it for a while to about uh, 10 million. Same size images. And if I store this uncompressed, just as double precision floating point numbers in MATLAB, it's about uh, 56 gigabytes. Okay. So on a really nice computer, you could store that in RAM. On my laptop, my laptop is more about 8 gigabytes of RAM. I can't fit that into RAM. So let's say, let's put it into, uh, let's assume our limit is about 1 gigabyte, and then I'll split this into 58 chunks. So we actually have code that will do this. It'll load a portion of it, look at it, analyze it, and then send it back. So we reload the code, apply the preconditioning, sample, keep the sampled version, which is small, just a small amount of data, and then throw away the rest. Okay, so our sampled version is all in memory, but the original data we just load once. We never have to see it again. So if we do this, here's compression keeping one out of every 100 entries. Here's taking one out of every 20 entries. We do quite well. So I was comparing this feature extraction because that was this green one, the next best method here. And you can see we do quite a bit better in much lower variance here. And if I go up a little bit, we do even better. It's still better than feature extraction. And we're getting close to the 0.92 baseline of k-means. I didn't actually run k-means on this data set because you can't run k-means on this data set. It's too large. Uh, you would have to have everything in memory, and you can't do that. So I just can't fit the memory. I can't do k-means. Assuming, since the data is very similar to the other data, I'm assuming k-means would do about 0.92% accuracy. OK, so how long does it take? Do we have a benefit? Well. If I have a large enough computer, I can load everything in and do k-means in memory. So I did this on a large computer, loaded it in memory, and just did one step, because it's very slow. So I'm extrapolating a little bit, so these numbers are not very precise. But we see roughly, in combined time, we have about 40 times speed. It's even better than we hoped for. We expect, in this case, gamma, by compression ratio, is 0 0.05, meaning I keep one out of every 20 data points. I'd expect it to be 20 times faster. But there's other issues that go on. Once you get large enough, you start to get sublinear time sometimes because you have memory issues, communication. So you actually get better than we expect in terms of speed up. OK, so this is the end of what I have to say. Um, we have a two-pass version, which is in the paper. We have other things like this. Uh, the two-pass version gets very, very high accuracy very quickly. Um, you can apply it to the other methods as well. So more information on our paper. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, we've got time for two questions. So if you've got a question that you're just itching, uh, now it's time to ask it. I also want to mention that after this talk, uh, Stephen's going to stick around in this room for about an hour. So if you have detailed questions, then please stick around. We'll talk about all the dirty details. But if you've got a big question, big picture question right now, uh, now it's time to ask. I'll ask one. Mike, uh, how are you populating your F and D matrices? Does the choice matter very much? For a Hadamard. Right. So, so we used to do a lot of Hadamard. Now we're doing more DCT. And, and so there's a there's a factor two that comes out in the bounds. Um, but it's just simpler. So if you do so, a Hadamard matrix is like a Fourier matrix. It's structured. You can apply it very quickly. Um, and it's nice because it's real valued. But unlike FOT, it has to be exactly a power of two. And that's been the annoying part. So you can pad the zeros, and that kind of changes things. And I don't really know. Most people say you just pad and pretend that's the answer. And I don't think that's really the answer. It does affect results. Um, especially for us, do we subsample from the true dimension or the padded dimension afterwards? We have to choose. So it's harder to make comparisons. So I started switching over to DCT because it's just simpler. Um, the implementation is also it's slower, unfortunately. But yeah. One more question. How about this? What are some of the other data sets that you've worked with in practice? Uh, you, have, you have MNIST. You have right. infinite MNIST. Right. Uh, what? Well, I try to avoid getting my hands dirty like that. <laughs> uh, a lot of image data sets, probably because then we have nice plots for paper. And it's like a nice category to work with. Um, 
if I give you cats and dogs, can you separate cats and dogs? No, I can't. Okay. Yeah, right. So, right, most of these are used more to illustrate the theorems and the overall principle of speeding things up and not for classification. So it's a good point. So for MNIST, we get 92% accuracy. MNIST has been around for maybe 15 years or 20 years. People have like 99.9% .9 accuracy on MNIST. Um, so we can't compete with that kind of stuff. And I don't know what they do. So that is sort of like a separate topic of like, how do you actually be good at practical <coughs> machine learning? So, and I'm not. <laughs> well, great. Let's thank Stephen Becker one more time. And let me just advertise the next colloquium. I hope that you'll all come uh, Friday. September 16th at 3 p.m., Dr. Art Owen from Stanford Statistics will be uh, here presenting on some interesting things. So thanks so much for coming to the very first club in the semester. Uh, have a good couple weeks. See you in a couple weeks. <laughs>